As we go through our academic careers, language learning is often a requirement. As we traverse different levels, we find what we like and what we don't, what works and what doesn't. Hi Internet, my name is Mark and I'm a computer science and linguistics student at NYU. Today I present you with the next video in this Duolingo vs. Rosetta Stone mini-series, which contains a bunch of interviews I've done with friends and family from college student level to adulthood. The last video in this mini-series, Duolingo vs. Rosetta Stone, was incredibly successful on my channel, and if you haven't already, I definitely encourage you to check that out once you're done. If you're curious about a specific question I ask, I'm gonna go ahead and throw a bunch of timestamps up on the screen, and you can jump around as you please. But without further ado, let's introduce our Vict <coughs> interviewees. Hello, my name is Felipe, I come from Ecuador, and, well, I went to a German school back home, and and did my studies there, and now I am currently living in Germany, about to study in a university here. I went to school in high school in Winchester, Massachusetts, and I um, took French, my seventh grade, eighth grade, and then all the way through high school. And um, then I went to the Uni University of Delaware and studied international relations and economics, and um, I graduated from there last year, and now I'm not using any language skills yet, but uh, now I'm just, you know, learning to fly. Art is a friend of mine who was born, grew up, and lives in St. Petersburg, Russia. For the rest of this video, I'll be reading Art's answers from the first person. I was raised in a monolingual household. English is my second language. I consider myself functionally bilingual, which means that my English is good enough to pass for fluency, and I can do it with pretty much all the same things I do with Russian, but there are also things that are easier to do in a specific language. My English feels less balanced across all areas of knowledge than my Russian, and my receptive vocabulary in English is considerably larger than my productive one more so than is typical for an average speaker, I think. I don't have a Sefer certificate, but I believe I should be able to hit C2. So I'm a CS major at NYU, and I've always had a bit of interest in language, especially in how language is constructed, and differences between languages, such as, you know, subject, verb, object, or verb, subject, object, you know? I am a college student, and I'm studying urban education and psychology and for my urban education major i am required to take language and so i chose asl because i feel like that's a language that's not as common as say like spanish like most urban education majors will learn spanish because um a lot of the population especially around where i live is uh very populated by uh, Spanish-speaking students, but there's also a lot of deaf students around where I live, so uh, I think both languages are crucial. I just chose ASL. Right, okay, so my name is Miguel, or, well, as you say, SAF is what I go by on the internet. Um, I am 21, soon to be 22 years old, and I'm from Denmark. I study software engineering, which is taught in, well, English and Danish, and that's kind of where my whole uh, multi-language experience comes from. I'm a yoga teacher. I've been teaching yoga for over 25 years. I am a scientist at heart, a linguist. I love languages and I speak French fluently, having spent my entire secondary education in France, in Switzerland, in French and Swiss systems and studied about seven years of German. So I'm here uh, to talk a little bit about my perspective as someone involved in developing products for language learners, specifically for kids who are learning English in this country, properly known as English language learners, a huge population of students in this country. So I'm here to share my experiences with that. Now that we've gotten everyone introduced, let's go ahead and jump into the general questions. These are based off of me wanting to pull concepts from everyone's varying environments. Now, I'm no seasoned interviewer, so please do forgive the constant death stare towards some of these interviews. But regardless, the way I'm presenting this information is for you, the viewer, to draw your own conclusions. Finding the patterns in these interviews on your own is a super rewarding feeling, and I'd love to hear your perspective in the comments down below. So right off the bat, having an incentive or a purpose for just about anything is key, especially when you're learning a language. From growing up in a foreign environment to learning a second language in school, I present to you various incentives that people have had for learning their second languages. In in school, you took, I guess you, you briefly signed up for Arabic, you did French in high school, and you did some Spanish in college. What were your incentives to do those languages? Um, I think, well, first off in high school, middle school, it's kind of like everybody has to speak a language. 
So you had Italian, Spanish, or French to choose from. Our mom being speaking fluent French, I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do French. You know, she could help me out. That was my incentive there. And then I think once I got to college, um, a lot of people don't take a language, but for my major, it was required that you got to a certain level in a language specifically for international relations. I ended up choosing a concentration in diplomacy. So yeah, I had I think I had to take two and a half years of a, of a language. So I decided to, I didn't want to jump into French because I was worried that I'd be in a high level and I like, it, it, I don't know, I felt like I wouldn't remember a lot. And I thought I was going to do Arabic and then uh, somebody told me that they took Arabic and pretty much everybody I talked to basically said like, you're literally not going to get above a C. I was worried about my GPA. So I was like, oh, I'll take Spanish. But I guess my incentive was like, I had to, I had to for my major. And then I was thinking, oh, if I go into something sort of with international ties, then I'd want to be, you know, proficient in a language. Well, yes. Okay. So Denmark is a fairly small country. We have about 6 million inhabitants here. We live in a big, big world where English is more and more prominent, uh, both in academia and like business. As you say, I've mentioned that uh, English is taught at a very young age. When I was in well, primary school, it was taught in third grade. So that's when you're usually it was uh, German is taught in eighth grade, which is like right when you're leaving primary school. We're also taught German. We're actually taught two languages during primary school, English and German. Yeah, ASL uh, just seemed very interesting to me because it's a visual language rather than an auditory language. And I find that I'm a more visual person, especially when it comes to languages, because in high school I tried to take French and I wasn't super good good at it. Uh, I, I didn't thrive in those classes so I chose ASL because I'm a more visual person and I have an easier time remembering what signs look like than what words mean what. Technically my first uh, second language uh, was Cantonese but that's just very very basic. And then uh, how about like German is that so is that like you know the school setting kind of push you to learn German? Yeah exactly. The school, well, in primary, uh, we were just, um, we just had German classes and we learned the basics and everything. But then in secondary, uh, I mean, kind of middle and high school, then they started to implement German more in other subjects like math or chemistry and physics. So that was even more, a lot more used. Yeah. So we have German. For, for school, we have Spanish. What about English? I know that like English is a really common language in academia, if not the most common. But like before yeah. that, I mean, we were talking in English five or six years ago. What was kind of your incentive or what, like what kind of got you to learn English? Well, for English, the incentive was about 12 years ago now, I think, when my parents wanted to go live in the U.S. to try out the American dream. Yeah. So they put... <laughs> my brother and i in some english courses and everything because we were just kids that didn't know almost any english at all and we were moving to the us so it was like okay now you have to learn and then we went to like uh, language school we learned a little bit our life back home in Ecuador was more comfortable and we had all of our friends family so we decided to come back and yeah afterwards i just kept using english because it's just so so useful. The concept of immersion comes up a lot in language learning. The best way to immerse yourself is by forcing yourself to speak, to think in a language, and really engage in that language's culture. So let's find out what role immersion plays in living, academic, and other environments. For me, it was uh, gaming. I was really into Call of Duty at the time, and I would come home from school, watch Face Clan, and uh, I believe someone KYR Speedy. This was all in English because they were American YouTubers. And that's kind of where I started picking up on some of the more uncommon words. Words you're not really taught in standard English class here in Denmark. Then I met people online and started talking to them. And that's kind of where it all spiraled down in seventh grade. I pretty much did not do anything during English class. I would never make my homework, which in retrospect probably was really bad my teacher hated me for it i was able to explain to her that well 
I do know English. I am learning. I'm just not learning it from the textbook. And she was kind enough to be like, oh, yeah, okay. I can see you're really practicing. You're using it. You're actually doing great. And I ended up with a good grade in English. I'm actually very curious about you. You just kind of mentioned that you're, you were learning outside of school, not using the textbook. Would you say that this has been like much more helpful than the textbook? I guess it was in, in an objective sense. Um, but would you say like really using the language, um, watching videos, like uh, speaking in the language, would you say that was like the main thing that helped you? Definitely, definitely. Um, the textbooks are very, I wouldn't say general conversation oriented, but it's like you're told to repeat the same sentence over and over again. When I decided to say, I'm just going to use English, it was like, I can use this in other ways than just asking for directions to the cafe. <laughs> Immersion was definitely um, a very, it's a very powerful part of picking up the subtleties of a language and the colloquialisms of a language. So it was challenging, it was hard, but yeah, you certainly learn how to speak the language. <clears throat> so kind of segueing into that, is that, would you say that immersion was the most helpful part? Did, did your teachers- Of learning French? Yeah. Absolutely. I did not study French in England, I, or I wasn't studying it before I moved to Switzerland, but the first part of picking up the language is the understanding. Mm -hmm. The speaking is really the, and then you read it, and then the speaking is really the last part. The most I do in terms of similar things to immersion is spending the majority of my watching, reading, texting time in English, which does happen a lot, but I really don't know if that counts. I would say that it's important to engage your target language as much as you're able to, and the more stuff you can connect it to, the quicker you'll progress and the more well-rounded your experience with it will be. If you learn a language by doing something you love, you'll try to devote more time to that because you're having fun, which is really the important part, regardless of whether you can do immersion or not. One of the reasons why languages are difficult to learn in a general academic setting is because of too much of the native language, such as English. However, the academic environment can be really conducive to learning as well. Here we see the academic environment weighed in pros and cons and how immersed classes can be really beneficial. I guess the non-helpful part is that the way that, I mean, you know, that classes are structured in college is you don't have it every day. So I think that's usually I think they try to do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So at least you have it three days a week. But I think that the non-continuity, I guess, of that is a struggle. The most helpful is just for that, like 50 minutes or an hour, or whatever in the class, like being just completely in that language was definitely helpful. And then I think for people in universities, it's cool because you can, especially if you get really into language, then you can go study abroad like we did. I think studying abroad is a good, I didn't do it for, for Spanish, but um, I think that's a cool opportunity afforded to you if you choose to do it. As long it. as it doesn't get cut short. <laughs> yeah, as long as Corona doesn't happen. Um, so actually I went to San on Tech and they only offered Russian. So they have a pretty strong incentive to learn Russian. And when I went to NYU, um, I decided I might as well continue Russian because I enjoyed it. And it was the language I was most familiar with outside of English and Cantonese. How would you say, how would you say those classes are different, like French in high school versus ASL in college? Honestly, the classes themselves are pretty similar because um, we learn in the same way. Like you look at a PowerPoint and um, you learn about the grammar and you learn about like which were like the vocabulary words and um so and you still take like quizzes and tests on what you're learning so the basic um format of the classroom is still the same um just for me personally i had a little bit more i had a little bit of a better attitude going into the college courses rather than the high school courses like something you chose versus something you're forced into sort of thing Yes, definitely. <laughs> I believe you mentioned that your classes, at least now, the higher level ones are taught like in ASL. Um, my first ASL course that I took at my college uh, was completely silent because my professor was deaf. So even though I didn't know the language yet and my classmates didn't know the language yet, we were fully immersed in it for that like hour and 50 minutes of class time two times a week. One, with ASL, you really have to pay attention because, like, in normal English classes, you can look down at your notebook and maybe be drawing or something and get off task. And you can just listen to the teacher so you're still kind of getting what's going on. But in this ASL class, I remember 
having to focus, like I never took my eyes off my professor because I needed to see what he was signing in order to understand what was going on in class. And so that was really, it was really difficult yeah, I'm at sure, first. <laughs> I'm sure like that challenge, would you say that really pushed you to learn faster? If, so uh, definitely. After I took that first honors class, I moved back to regular level because um, I wasn't, because when I took that first class, I was a deaf education major, and then I got moved back into regular classes when I switched to an urban education major, and so I was not super far ahead of my classmates in ASL 102, but I definitely, I definitely had more practice than they did. Do you say there were any kind of negative aspects about having to learn in a classroom environment even though in the classroom we were getting a bunch of practice and we were to do it like it was all silent and it was completely asl when i came out of the classroom i wasn't able to practice that with anybody else i mean i was lucky enough to make friends in the class and then we started practicing together outside of class time. Learning a second language is challenging for various reasons, from learning to make different sounds to speaking with your hands instead of your mouth. Here are some challenges that our interviewees faced in their language learning journeys and how they overcame them. When, you, when you're when you learning, I guess I'll focus on Russian, but what's the most challenging thing about learning Russian? Also for Russian, the grammar is definitely um, complicated, but it's also one of the nicer aspects of language, as in if you can understand the grammar and you can um, utilize it to your advantage, you can actually convey a lot more meaning than you can in English. You mentioned that you didn't do French because you didn't want to do a too advanced level. Was that kind of also related to the GPA thing or and stuff, or was that? Um, I think that I had just done six years of it, and I was kind of tired of, I don't know, in retrospect, I wish I had just stuck with it because then I think I could have been actually, I don't know, I could have had a better base. Um, but I mean, once you already have some sort of like, you understand the the way that it, a class is structured in order to learn a language and like French and Spanish, you have different languages, but they have a lot of the same root like principles. So like once you understand kind of what you have to learn, I guess, I, yeah, I wish I'd stuck with French, but I think I was just kind of like, oh, I'll, I'll learn Spanish. Why not like try just a new one? I, I didn't really, uh, I should have kind of thought it through more, but I, I guess I didn't like my background says, oh, you've taken six years, you took AP French, but at the same time, I was like, I hadn't done it in a while, and I just felt like it would, that wouldn't reflect, so. In some parts, German is very similar to the languages, like a couple of words can can sound similar or make sense. It's, you can kind of see some relations because also English comes from, so the kind of scientific name for English was Anglo-Saxon, right? Or something yeah, like that? So, yeah, it's a Germanic. And it's, yeah, Saxon. Saxony is a place in Germany, so they also share some roots and everything. So yeah, they have many shared. I'd say um, try and work more on the <laughs> the Adidas. So, for example, um, English you use the book, the chair, the window, but in German you use um, das Buch, the um, the Bildschirm. So you use different. Uh, genders for different words and it's very confusing also because they may differ at something because a, a word can have a masculine nomenclature in spanish but in german it's neutral or feminine and then that also gets confusing and of course the best way to learn from others is by hearing their experiences it might not be what we think, but it might be exactly what we need so here are some of the best tidbits of advice i've received from our interviewees and what kind of advice would you give for like, like if I want, if I wanted to hold on to French for the rest of my life, but didn't do it outside of school? That's a really good question because I don't think I've actually thought about it that much. Um, I would say that it was very, the way I held on to the language was speaking it to you and your sister when you were young. Um, but the inherent problem you run into is that when the culture doesn't support uh, the language, um, you try speaking French to your kids, but they speak English back to you. 
Uh, or you have an older sister, for example, who does all the talking for you and you don't speak <laughs> for three years, whatever. So, so that was one way of trying to sustain the language and trying to integrate it into our everyday life. Otherwise, I've just taken the opportunity, I think, I just, I just don't take pleasure in really reading in French. I don't really gravitate towards um, reading in that language, I think, because there's just so much uh, for me to do in the English language, and that's the culture, that it has gotten rusty. But if you want to keep it up. You got to read. You got to read your French books. You got to read um, newspapers in French. You got to speak to, to French Get the um, people down. whose uh, first language is French. Um, yeah, so all those things. You got to travel to French countries. You want to read everything out loud as much as you're able to. Making sounds is a lot more difficult than telling sounds apart, and this will also get you used to the sound of your own awkwardness, which will, in turn, be massively helpful when you become ready to tackle actually speaking and not just parroting phrases. If you're dealing with a new writing system, come up with mnemonics for elements, then try to start reading as soon as possible. You don't have to understand a single word. You just want to get a place where you can recognize all slash some basic, because all isn't really feasible for, say, a beginner of Mandarin, but all alphabets are achievable, symbols and what sound they translate to. In this day and age, you can probably push writing by hand to a later date and focus on reading and typing first. Last and most importantly, don't let linguistic discrimination deceive you with its false promise of superiority. All languages are beautiful, important, and worth learning. Any amount of language knowledge is a great achievement that should be celebrated. All words and rules are made up. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but things we say to each other have so much more power than that. Overall, would you have any advice to give to current college students or upcoming college students who are taking a language or perhaps even advice on picking a language? Well, um, if you go to university, I'm sure that most universities have many choices for language. And... Something I would recommend is definitely trying out different languages, especially if you weren't like, I guess, like forced to take a certain language in high school. Because if they, let's say, spend like, I don't know, three or four hours trying out each language and you find one that sort of vibes with you, then I would say go for that one. Because you don't want to be, you know, a semester or two semesters in and be like, well, I don't really like the language anymore and I wish I took this one instead. That, like, initial i guess a like trial period would definitely be um something you would want to go for so now i want to throw a different perspective at you what about learning english as a second language in american school systems matthew is a product manager at lexia learning who creates software for esl students or ells in the american school system uh quick note rosetta stone nor lexia learning are affiliated with this video lexia learning right so what's your role there so my role at lexia learning in product management and product marketing two roles one is to make sure we try to find a balance between a lot of things that people know are the right way kids should be learning in school. And then there's also the reality of what, what it is that the people who buy the products want to see in the products. Mm -hmm. So my role is to try to balance both of those things. Gotcha, and would you say you have a pretty good overview about all the aspects that go into a product? Yes, but not from a, not necessarily from an academic perspective, more from a standpoint of how to actually make it work, um, balancing all the stake, balancing all the perspectives of all the different groups involved. When it comes to developing software, I'm curious as to what are the most critical elements, like where's the most thought put into when you're, you're creating a product from um, your focus on student interaction with the product or yeah. what metrics the product gives to a teacher, for example. At our company, it really begins with what is, the, what is the learning outcome we're trying to achieve? What is it that, what is the student population's challenges like what are their challenges whether it's around reading and literacy whether it's around second language learning what are their challenges and how can we best try to meet their challenges within the framework of the school district so it's not it's student it's thinking about a student and what their needs are but it's also thinking about our products in the context of the classroom and the role of the teacher so that's that's where it all starts from there we find people who then are experts in that particular field so whether it's whether it's third graders who might um, have uh, dyslexia or whether it's a fifth grader who might just be a couple of years behind because they haven't read enough, you know, growing up. It's really all about finding people who then know exactly how to design learning applications. Then comes the software after that. So then you figure out well, what is technology able to do? How is it that technology can help to meet the need as it's as it's determined by the experts who really understand um, learning? And so that, that need, when you're, you're um, defining that need, that's how it complements the teacher. That's yes. the main goal of that. It's a twofold thing. So when we think about 
how to help meet a challenge in a, with a student in a school. It's about what do we know, what do the experts know about that particular challenge that the student is having mm-hmm. or the situation they're in. Like, for example, with English language learning, it's not a challenge that they have per se, like a learning challenge. It's like they are in a certain situation. What is that situation they're in and how to best support what they need? Then it's also the role of the teacher. So we know that the teacher plays an important role in the products we design. So how, how can we provide an experience where the students are learning things on their own when they can, Mm -hmm. but understanding when the teacher gets involved, how can we give some pointers to the teacher as to what specifically, rather than just say, now teach Mark Bacon, you can say, well, Mark has shown that he has some challenges in these areas, so focus your lessons in that particular area. Are there any methods or specific utilities that have been reported through observation or reported by metrics that have uh, been promising? The two, you know, two of the fundamental, foundational ideas are these idea of the language frames, which frankly, you know, you can use, you can teach language frames in a very non-technological way. We just happen to adopt that pedagogy. And the other one, which is really interesting, which is new, we believe, is to really celebrate language, native language as an asset. So an asset model, meaning you're not trying to discourage a young learner and think that they're somehow shouldn't be speaking their native language. What you're actually trying to do is encourage them to see their native language as an asset. They speak a language that the other kids in their in their class don't speak. Right. So that that sort of asset model is sort of a motivational aspect of it. So I'm just editing this video now and I'm noticing that we're coming up on 30 minutes. I had asked each interviewee some pretty specific questions about what languages they're learning and what their environments are like. So I'll definitely have a follow-up video coming up then on those more specific questions. Also, if you'd like to see a longer format of each of these interviews, because we only showed like three, maybe four of each person for each question, definitely let me know as well because I'd love to work on a longer video. It just will be a bit long. Anyway, let's roll the outro. Thank you so much for watching this video. The interviews were so fun and there's so much material. If you did end up finding any patterns or coming to your own conclusions, definitely leave them in the comments below because I'd love to open my mind to new ideas. And of course, don't forget to subscribe down below if you enjoyed. I have a few more language learning videos coming out from a longer version of this video to how we can replace our social media use with learning apps and foreign language articles to help ourselves learn a second language in our free time every day. And don't hesitate to take a look at some previous videos I've made like this one so you can get a sneak peek at what you're gonna get in the future. Thanks again for watching, don't stop learning, and as always, don't forget, to stay awesome. That if you want to learn a language, you have to be passionate and proud about learning that language. This sounds so cheesy, but like fall in love with it, I guess, because you'll see it as more beautiful.